Today we are actually, we are concluding this message series. This is the third time I think I've concluded it, but this is the conclusion of our series, Prayer That God Answers. And in this series we're talking about how to better communicate with God. And that's what prayer is all about, communicating with God, uh, building a relationship with Him. Today we're going to be talking about honest prayer. How to be honest when we pray with God. What's the opposite of being honest? It's, well, it's being dishonest. Rather than being honest with God, sometimes we do things that don't make much sense. We try to hide from God. We try to hide things in our life from Him. We're not honest with God. Hiding from God is not a new thing. It began in the Garden of Eden. It happened when Adam and Eve sinned. And... Genesis 3, 8, after they sinned it, and they, that's Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and among the trees of the garden. So people have been hiding themselves from God down through the centuries. And we even sometimes can get caught up in hiding from God. People try to hide from God in a number of ways. Some people try to hide from God, they don't want to go to church or be involved in uh, small group Bible studies. Other people try to hide by not praying at all or perhaps by not being honest in their prayers. They tell God what they think He wants to hear rather than what is really going on in their lives. Why do people try to hide from God? Well, it's the same root issue as Adam and Eve had in the garden. It's sin in our lives makes us want to hide from God or hide parts of our life from Him. The psalmist says in Psalm 66, 8, If I had cherished iniquity or sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And so this sin in which we may try to hide from God also interferes with God listening or hearing us. Of course, he knows what we're saying, but to say listen means he's listening to, to answer and put into practice. And so we, if we have this sin in our hearts, it makes us want to hide from God, and it also interferes with God listening to us. It breaks our relationship or hinders our relationship with God. Not only does sin in our lives, unrepented sin, cause a an impediment in our relationship with God, it also can bring consequences. It can bring God's judgment in our lives. The Old Testament in Deuteronomy, God was speaking to Moses, telling him what was going to happen after the nation of Israel entered the promised land. Now, because of sin in Moses' life, he was not allowed to enter the promised land. One of the greatest men and prophets who ever lived was not allowed to enter the promised land because of the consequences of his own sin. And the Lord said to Moses, what was going to happen in the future? This people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering. And they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and they will be devoured. Wow. Doesn't sound too good, does it? That are the consequences of sin. It's God's judgment that was going to come on the nation of Israel. And we're going to talk about that today. In a few minutes, we're going to get to a psalm that was written by a believer who was in exile because of God's judgment in Babylon. And we're going to see a prayer that he prayed that's going to help us. Because sometimes God seems distant. How should we pray when God seems far away? How should we pray if things aren't going well in our lives? Perhaps we may be facing some consequences to sin in our lives. How should we pray? How should we pray when we're not sure if God is listening? Well, first and foremost... We should examine our own lives. We should examine if there's any known sin in our lives, repent of that sin, ask for God's forgiveness. If we're hanging on to some sin or some secret sin, that's going to continue to imped, impede our relationship with God. 
And so whatever anyone here is going through that may cause God to seem distant to you, whatever you're going through that it may seem that God is not hearing or answering your prayers, know that God wants your relationship with him to be better. He wants to have a close relationship with you. And he's made it possible for that to happen. And so don't cover up, don't hide anything that's going on in your own heart from him. Be honest with him about what you're feeling, about what you're experiencing. And listen to what he has to say back to you. He wants you to grow in your relationship with him. And so today we're going to look at Psalm 74. There's 150 psalms in the Bible. It's uh, the longest book in the Bible. And the psalms are, are, most of them are wonderful prayers. Some are worshipful, uh, worship to God. And they're there not just to tell us what happened long ago or prayers that people prayed thousands of years ago. They're there to teach us, to help us to connect with God in different seasons of our lives. Psalm 74 was written after the Babylonian invasion of Judah in 586 B.C. And in that invasion, the temple of God was destroyed and the people were carried away into captivity in exile in Babylon. And why did this tragedy happen? Well, we've already read the Lord told Moses what was going to happen, and indeed it did happen. The people of Judah had sinned because of the idolatry. They broke the covenant that God had made with them, and they were in a difficult situation. So we're going to learn from this psalm, from this prayer that was prayed by, we don't know who, but a, a believer in that time, how to pray when God seems to be distant, how to pray when things are going are being tough in our lives. First of all, as we've been talking about, we need to be honest with God. The psalm begins in verse 1. He says, Oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? And so the psalmist understands why judgment came to Judah and yet he begins to ask, why does it seem to go on forever? How long is this going to last? Why is God still angry? We're here. I'm here. I'm calling on him. And I'm seeking to follow him as, as my shepherd. And so the psalmist begins by asking questions. He's honest. He's real about the things that are, that are going through his mind, going through his heart. Of course, he knows that God sees everything. But he speaks to God. He he prays to him. He tells him what he's feeling. He reminds God of their relationship. Verse 2, remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. And so the psalmist calls on God to remember how things used to be when they were worshiping in the promised land, when they were worshiping in the temple, when they were worshiping in Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem. God had redeemed Israel from slavery in Egypt, brought them into the promised land. God's people were his inheritance. He dwelt with them, with his presence. The psalmist was remembering what things had been like when things were better. He described what happened in verse 3 and 7. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. They, see your san they set your sanctuary on fire. They profaned your dwelling place of your name, bringing it down to the ground. And so the psalmist prays. He calls on God. Look at the ruins. Look at what's left. Now, he's no longer living there in that country. He's living in exile. But his heart is breaking for the destruction in Israel. The Babylonian army had demolished the temple. Not only had they burned it, they purposely defiled it. In one way or another, the place, the very place where the presence of God had dwelt. The Ark of the Covenant was destroyed. Even the raiders can't find it anymore. 
that's dating me, but there were, <clears throat> there were no, um, and so the, in the verses here that we're not reading, we can't read the whole psalm, but describes how they came in with axes and destroyed everything, burned everything with fire. Uh, the, the magnificent temple that Solomon had built was no more. He speaks of, the psalmist speaks of God's silence. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, and there is none among us who knows how long. How long, O oh God, is the photoscoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? And so the psalmist moves to the present. In exile in Babylon, God seems distant. There seem to be no signs. There seem to be no miracles of God happening. There seem to be no prophets. The word of the Lord is not coming forth. Nobody knows how long God's judgment is going to last. He asks God, is this going to continue forever? Now, how can we apply some of the principles of this prayer to our own lives today? Again, we need to understand this is so crucial to understand when we read the Bible. Yes, it is a record of a prayer that somebody prayed thousands of years ago. But it's not there just to tell us what this person prayed. It's there to teach us how to pray in our circumstances in the year 2022 when we're going through a similar experience. And if you're like me, there may have been times in your life or maybe somebody here is going through a time when God seems distant when you ask God questions and you don't hear any answer, there are times that we go through. There are times when we are suffering in our lives in one way or another. And we wonder, is this going to go on forever, God? Is there going to be an end to this? Or is this something that's going to continue year after year, month after month? And so whatever our situation in life is today, we mustn't hide from God. The psalmist didn't hide from God. He, he began to ask God questions. And perhaps he was reticent at first to ask God questions, but God doesn't mind us asking him questions. He wants to hear what's on your heart. He wants to hear the questions that you have. Because unless we're honest with him, we're not going to be able to experience that closeness once again. And so whatever your situation is today or whatever it may be in the future, be honest with God. Just talk to him. Tell him what's going on. Sometimes people tell me, I don't know how to pray. <clears throat> Just speak what's on your heart. Just talk to God like you're talking to another person. He is another person. But he is also the creator, the Lord of lords, the king of kings, the creator of the universe. He knows everything. Sometimes people say, why do I need to tell God something? He knows everything. Well, that's true. But we build a relationship with him by talking to him, by opening up to him. He wants you to talk to him about what's going on. Remember what things were like if. When your relationship with God was better, remember that. Talk to God about that. God, I want to be back in that relationship. I want to turn back to you. I want things to be the way they were once before. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the Lord tells people in one of the churches, remember your first love. You've fallen away from that love. Remember how things were. Remember your first love. Talk to God about that. Tell God you want to hear him speak to you again. Tell him that you want to be close to him again. Or perhaps closer than you've ever been. Be honest with God in your prayers. And then remember God's power. Psalmist so continues in verse 12. He says, yet God, my king, is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. So even though this disaster has struck, even though this psalmist is in exile in Babylon, he remembers who God is. He doesn't say, yet God is king, which would be true. He says, God is my king. He remembers that God is his king. 
God is the only one who saves and delivers. There's no one like God. He begins to turn his attention to God's power. He retells God's past miracles. Verse 13, you divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. What's he talking about here? He's remembering as the people of Israel came out of exile from Egypt, they were facing the Red Sea. The Egyptian army was coming in behind them, seemed to be hopeless, and God divided the sea. And they crossed over on dry ground. The Egyptian army came right after them into the sea, but God closed the sea over the Egyptian army and they all drowned. And that's what it's speaking of, the heads of the sea monsters, the Egyptian army that was after them to gobble them up was destroyed and broken in the Red Sea. He's remember God's deliverance in the past, and if God could do it in the past, he can do it again in the future. He worshiped God as creator, verse 16. He said, yours is the day and also the night. You've established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Now, sometimes people say, I, I don't know what to praise God for. Everything is going wrong in my life. I, there's just nothing to thank him for. Well, the psalmist here is worshiping God as the creator. If, if nothing is going on right in your life, according to you, you can still worship him for being creator. He created the sun, the moon, the stars, the universe that's so vast that we can't see the end of it with any of our fancy telescopes and satellites and that. It's, it just goes on and on and on. Psalmist worships God who created the day, who created the night, who created the seasons, the summer, the winter. So as we look at this prayer, we see a sequence. First of all, the psalmist began speaking about the difficult situation that he was in. Being honest, asking God questions about the difficulties he was experiencing. But now in this second section of the prayer, the psalmist turns his gaze away from his problem and begins to fix it on God. Now, if in your prayer life, your entire prayer life is only focused on your problems, you're going to end up being very discouraged when you get done praying. And I have done that. Oh, God, everything's awful. God, do something. God, it's just, ah. Oh, oh. And I go away feeling more discouraged than before I prayed. God wants us to turn from the problem to fix our eyes on him when we pray. The psalmist is reminding God and himself of, of God's great power, that he's king of kings, he's lord of lords, he's king of the whole earth. And he begins to pray to God, reminding God, and more of all, reminding himself of God's past miracles. Miracles of God in creation. We can do the same. We can praise God for the miracle of creation. We can praise God for the miracles that we see recorded in Scripture. And we can give God praise for the miracles that He's worked in our lives, that He's worked in our church family. And as we begin to think about God, as we begin to focus on God of who He is, what He's done in the past, our faith begins to grow. Our faith begins to build we begin to see God as bigger than our problems, as God bigger than the difficulties we're going through. We begin to see that no situation is hopeless because of God. We begin to see that with God, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible for him. So then the psalmist ends his prayer by calling on God to act. Verse 18, remember this, O Lord. How the enemy scoffs and a foolish people reviles your name. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to the wild beasts. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. So in this final section of the prayer, he calls on God to act. When ungodly people are 
are persecuting believers, they're also mocking God himself, reviling his name. The psalmist reminds God that his people and he himself are like a fragile dove. You know, doves don't have a lot of defense, do they? Uh, they are prey for various predators. They're in danger of being devoured by wild beasts. He asked God not to forget his afflicted people who are under his judgment. And so he's laying out an argument for God's intervention based on what he knows God is like. He reminds God of his promises. He says, have regard for the covenant, verse 20. For the dark places of the land are full of the habitation of violence. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. And so the psalmist reminds God of his past promise, his covenant that he would bring his people into the land of promise. But now the land was filled with violence, the land was filled with darkness, and they weren't even there. The poor and needy were uh, oppressed, they were in disgrace, and yet the psalmist looks to a brighter future, a brighter future where they would once again praise the Lord for his goodness, for his deliverance. And so we ask God to bring deliverance. He says, Arise, O God, defend your cause. Remember how the foolish scoff at you all the day. Do not forget the clamor of your foes, the uproar of those who rise against you, which goes up continually. So he calls on, the psalmist calls on God to rise up, to defend God's cause. Now notice throughout this, this psalm, the the psalmist is appealing to God based on God's character, based on God's interest, God's glory. The psalmist says that fools mock God all day. The pagans in this pagan country in which he was living. Not only did they mock God, they mock God's people. He's asking God to not ignore the enemies. The enemies of the psalmist, the enemies of God. He's calling on God to act for the glory of God's name. And so the psalmist's prayer concludes with his call on God to act, to deliver. And so we too talk to God about the problem. We remembered God's greatness, his power, the miracles he's done in the past. And then we call, him, call on him to act in the situation that we find ourselves in. We call on God to act based on who he is, and his promises in his word. We identify ourselves as being part of God's people. We call on God to act, not just for ourselves, but because of the broader family of God that we are part of. We want to pray according to God's will. Suppose... Let's think of some situations where we may be struggling. Suppose somebody's struggling with a health issue of one kind or another. And we can ask God to heal because the issue is bothering us, because the issue is painful, and that's okay. But how much better to look at the promises in God's word, the promises of healing, and, and build our faith. That God is a God who heals. God is a God who heals because he has compassion on us, because he loves us. And because he has plans and purposes for us. And as God brings healing into our lives, we can carry out his purpose for our lives that we couldn't carry out if we were sick. As God brings healing into our lives, we are able to praise him for that healing and bring glory to his name. When our prayers are first and foremost about God's glory, and not simply about ourselves, we're going to see more of our prayers answered. And that applies to any other situation you may be going through. Now the answer to this psalmist's prayer are not recorded in this psalm, but we do know that God answered the prayer. The exiles began to return from the land 70 years after the exile began, as God had promised through the prophet. So God calls on each of us. 
to not hide from Him, but to be real and honest in our prayers. Of course, it's kind of foolish not to be honest, isn't it? Because God knows everything in our hearts anyhow, but He wants us to talk to Him about that. Tell God what's going on. Ask Him questions. It's okay. He can take it. And as you pray, don't remain stuck on your problem. Remember God's power. Remember who He is. Remember that nothing is impossible for Him. Remember His past miracles. Remember miracles He's done in your life. Remember miracles He's done in other people's lives that you know. Worship Him as Creator. Sometimes you just look around. What can you see in today? Well, he didn't make chairs, but he made people. They're his most amazing creation. Look around at people. You're outside, look around at the sky, the clouds, the sun, the trees. Be amazed at the things that God has done, his great power. And as you do, your faith, if you go, your faith is going to grow. Of course, we can always thank him if you're a believer here this morning for sending Jesus to save us. Taking a hopeless situation and restoring us to a relationship with God. And finally, call on God to act in your situation. Not just for you, but for his glory. Call on God with a view to seeking his kingdom first. In everything you do, every prayer that you pray. And as we do that, as we learn to pray, as we learn the principles of this psalm and the other scriptures, as we put those into practice, our prayers will become more powerful, they'll become more effective, and we're going to see more answers. And God wants to see us have answers to our prayers. And he said, as he answers our prayers, he's going to bring joy into our lives. Now, to have a relationship with God, it all, it all begins with three simple steps. To begin a relationship with God for the very first time, we need to admit that we've sinned, that we've done wrong things. And those things have separated us from Him. We need to admit that we've sinned, repent, turn away from that sin, believe that Jesus died, that our sins might be forgiven. Invite him into our lives and commit our lives to following him and his plan for our lives. And he has a wonderful plan for each and every one of our lives. So I'd like to ask us all now to pray right now. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads. We're going to pray. If you've never prayed a prayer like this before, if you're here in person or watching online, I'd encourage you to pray along with me. Pray something like this. Of course, if you are a believer here today, perhaps God is prompting your heart to recommit your life to him this morning. And I encourage you to pray along with me if you're sensing that prompting. Father, today I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. I've been following my own plan for my life and not yours. And I repent. I turn away from that. I ask for you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, paid the penalty for my sin, that I might be forgiven. Come into my life. I believe you rose from the dead. You're alive today. And I commit myself to following you and your plan for my life all of my days. Let's pray as well. Father, today we thank you for your word. We thank you for this book of Psalms. We thank you for Psalm 74 written thousands of years ago. Forgive us for the times when we ignore all the lessons and instructions that's in your word that are there to teach us how to pray. And so we pray, God, that we would be able to apply the principles that you're seeking to teach us this morning found in this psalm. Help us to be honest and real in our prayers. Telling you exactly what's on our heart. Help us to talk about even the things that are painful, even the things that are difficult. Asking you questions.
then help us to take our eyes off of our problem and focus them on you. Help us to understand how powerful you are. Help us to praise and worship you as creator. Help us to praise and worship you for the past miracles that you've done. Help us to remember and thank you for the things that you've done in our lives. We pray that our faith would be built as we call on you to act in our situation or as we're praying for someone else. Help our faith to grow that you can do the impossible. That all things are possible for you based on your promises. And God, we pray that your enemies would be defeated. Enemies who are seeking to steal, kill, and destroy in our lives and the lives of other people. We pray that they would be defeated and your people delivered from their power. And we're going to thank you. We're going to praise you for the answers to our prayers. We're going to give you glory. We're going to tell others about how you answered our prayers. And today we remember missionaries uh, Steve and Jill McCarthy who are uh, ministering in a, a tough place in this country of Uruguay. We thank you for the churches that are being planted there, even in the, in the midst of the pandemic, God. We pray that you give them wisdom. We pray that you give them strength. We pray that you give them resources, that your kingdom might be expanded in that country. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.